Alex is an archivist and assistant professor at Boise State University. Alex holds a Master of Arts in History with a focus on 20th century American history and a Master of Library Science specializing in archives and records management from Indiana University. He also received a bachelor's degree in American Studies from Hillside College. And this presentation is part of a larger archival research project examining the full history of Caxton Printers and its founder, James H. Gibson. His research is, suppo is supported in part by grants from the Idaho Humanities Council and Boise State's Osher Institute. And let's welcome Alex up here. Thank you, Brandy, for that uh, generous introduction. Some 70 years ago, an Idaho writer quipped that, of all the states of the nation, Idaho is the last one in which one would expect to find a publishing house, let alone a successful one. And yet, in this very state, there is a successful publishing house, one that has been around for over 100 years, and one that has set a standard for regional publishing. That company is Caxton Printers, founded in 1907 in Caldwell, Idaho. Over the last century, Caxton has published hundreds of books in numerous genres. Americana, fiction, poetry, children's stories, essays, history, and economics, among others, with subjects primarily about the Western US and Idaho in particular. It's not an exaggeration to say that Caxton has, has published more books about Idaho than any other publishing company. So without Caxton, we wouldn't be able to understand Idaho in the way that we do. Many of the books that Caxton has published likely wouldn't have been published by any other publishing firm and so their contents would have remained unknown. Caxton's books are invaluable to the study of Idaho. The title for my talk this evening comes from James H. Gibson, the founder of Caxton Printers. His full quotation reads, I don't regard books as mere merchandise. They're the basis of all culture, education, and progress. And that belief really guided his entire life as well as the entire company. The story of Caxton is remarkable given their publishing philosophy, their location, and the quality of their books. The company's philosophy, which lines up with that quotation, was to help writers get published regardless of whether or not Caxton earned a profit. They were particularly focused on Western writers who couldn't get published elsewhere. And their location in Caldwell is especially surprising. In the early 1900s, there were very few publishers west of the Mississippi and even fewer in a small town of just a few thousand in the foothills of the Rocky Mountains. And on top of all that, they were very much concerned, and are still concerned, with producing well-made books. James H. Gibson established Caxton's philosophy almost, and is almost single-handedly responsible for the success of Caxton printers. He went by J.H., or to his friends, just Jim. Gibson directed the company from its founding in 1907 until his death in 1965, a span of almost 60 years. The story of Caxton really starts in the 1890s when the Gibson family moved, from, uh, moved, it to, moved to Idaho. J.H. Gibson's parents, Albert E. Gibson and Lina West Gibson, brought their eight children from Greeley, Colorado to Idaho in 1891. And in that photo in the center, in the top is Albert E. Gibson, and then in the center in the bottom is, is the matriarch, uh, Lina West Gibson. They moved first to Payette and then to Boise before settling in Caldwell in 1893. And then J.H. in that photo is the second from the left in the back row. Shortly after settling in Caldwell, the elder Gibson, Albert, acquired a small printing pet press and founded the Gem State Rural Newspaper in 1895. It was a monthly paper intended to fill a niche in southwestern Idaho. It was self-described as a western farm paper that was devoted to horticulture, stock, farm, and irrigation matters. And it was in that small shop that J.H. Gibson first learned about printing and how to work printing presses and about publishing. He worked there in his teens, as did several of his brothers. J.H. wasn't the only Gibson to child to have a remarkable life. In fact, the entire Gibson family, frankly, is, is quite remarkable. One of their sons is Lawrence Henry Gibson, who was a graduate of the University of Idaho 
and it was the first Rhodes Scholar from Idaho, and in fact was in just the very second class of Rhodes Scholars ever in 1903. Lawrence Henry went on to win the Pulitzer Prize in History for his 15-volume series, The British Empire Before the American Revolution. He taught at Lehigh University for nearly half a century. A daughter, Alice E. Gibson, took her PhD from Yale and was dean at Lindenwood University in Missouri for over 25 years. She's the author of two books, both of which were published by Caxton. Ruth Gibson Plowhead, another daughter, was a children's author. In total, she published seven children's books, all through Caxton, so it helped to have the family connection. And here she is pictured with her two daughters, Ruth and Eleanor Fern. Plowhead's first book, Lucretia Ann on the Oregon Trail, was published in 1931 to great critical acclaim and received many favorable reviews. The book, in fact, is still in print uh, and is available through Caxton. And its popularity led Plowhead to write two more books featuring the Lucretia Ann character. In addition to writing books, Ruth Gibson Plowhead also was probably the most genealogically minded of the Gibson family, of her siblings at least. And she organized and wrote a Gibson family history book with brief biographies of her siblings and her parents. I'll quote briefly from her own entry, which was written in 1929. Perhaps someone will someday be curious about me, so I will say that we live in what is called the flapper age, and even we older ones, about 50 years of age, may be as gay and youthful as we please without exciting comment. We wear dresses with short, tight-fitting skirts. I weigh in the neighborhood of 115 pounds, am five feet tall, and, and am five feet five inches tall. I really love how forthright she is and how honest she is about describing herself and her age. And uh, as a historian, right, keeping in all those uh, important details uh, is immensely helpful, if only all historical figures were that careful to note and describe themselves. And beyond that genealogical book, uh, the family maintained a chain letter for almost 60 years. And so in this chain letter, one sibling would write a letter and then mail it to their sibling. And then that sibling would write their own letter and then mail the original letter and the new letter onto the third sibling and so on until it made it all the way back around. And they maintained that chain from 1911 until 1970, which is really remarkable. Um, and it ended only be because the, it was the last two siblings that were alive. And more importantly, they, were able, they saved all 60 years worth of those letters. And it's really a remarkable treasure. And it's great both for the personal family history as well as what it reveals about what was going on nationally. So you can read really moving and touching tributes when, say, their parents, one of their parents died or when a sibling passed away. But then you can also get uh, their take on what was going on nationally, say when Pearl Harbor occurred or the stock market crash of 1929. So it's this really rich uh, genealogical and historical glimpse into one Western American family. And it's, they're in the, they're all, they were saved uh, at, and they're deposited at Princeton University because Lawrence Henry, the historian, was friends with uh, some librarians and a gentleman named Carl Van Doren who worked at Princeton and they arranged to have all those letters deposited there. So that, those are some glimpses of those letters and one of my favorite parts about them is, are the salutations. And, and you may not be able to read it, so I'll read some of them to you. They, they include, dear chain members, dear members of the chain, to all the dear ones, links in the chain, dear people all, or simply dear people. And there's J.H. Gibson at his desk. And J.H. didn't even finish high school. He attended the University of Idaho as a special student for one year before returning to Caldwell to work in his father's print shop, where he spent the, the rest of his life working in Caldwell. In 1904, Gem State Rural published its first book, which was a play titled Plot Against Plot by Tomé Luis de Freitas, a sheep herder from the Azores, who approached Gibson about printing the book and three other plays. Though I've never read it completely, I gather that it's not high literature. <laughs> However, there is a scene set in Boise in a bar, so technically it could be con considered Idaho literature. 
And from a bibliographical perspective, it's very rare. Uh, I know of just three libraries that have a copy, and the one at Boise State is merely a facsimile. But it's been digitized and is available through the Internet Archive, should any of you want to sit down and read it. J.H. Gibson took over the, as managing director around the same time that they published Plot Against Plot. In 1907, when he was just 21 years old, he incorporated the company as Caxton Printers. These are the articles of incorporation, which show the company was very much a family affair. Of the five signatories on the right, four were Gibson family members, and the fifth was the original business partner of Albert E. Gibson in Gem State Rural. The company is named for William Caxton, who you may know um, is believed to be England's first printer who lived during the, the 15th century. And in addition to borrowing his name, Gibson also borrowed Caxton's colophon, which is a printer's emblem or logo. So on the left is William Caxton's 15th century colophon, and then on the right is, is Caxton printer's colophon. And there's J.H. Gibson with a bust of Caxton, which for a long time that bust sat outside of Caxton's offices above the front door. So in the 19-teens, Caxton was primarily a traditional print shop with commercial printing, litho lithography, and a binding department. A few years later, they added they branched out and added um, a department for school and office supplies and eventually became Idaho State Textbook Depository in the 1920s, which was a very lucrative contract, and it's a status they maintain to this day. In their early years, they did also print books on contract. That means they're private printings where the author pays for the books to be uh, printed and bound and delivered to the author. And the print shop has no uh, control over the distribution. Some of Caxton's earliest books were produced for the state government. They published, for example, in the center there, the Proceedings of the Idaho Constitutional Convention in 1912, and then on the left, the Early History of Idaho a year later. And both of these were paid for by the state of Idaho and then distributed by the government. Other early Caxton books from the 19-teens included Syringa Blossoms by J.D. Flenner and Irish Mag, by Earl Wayland Bowman. Both of them were published uh, with uh, this suede leather covers, uh, which was not common for Caxton or for other book publishers either. Um, and unfortunately, they tend to deteriorate quite rapidly. Uh, most of the Caxton's books were simply bound in traditional hardbound. And two of their other early books, uh, I think the first one dated in 1920, were uh, written by an inmate at the Idaho State Penitentiary. Be Behind Gray Walls and Shadows of the Gallows by <laughs> Lifer Number 2338, P.C. Murphy. This is the Caxton office in 1915. On the second from the right is J.H. Gibson, and then on the far right is Albert Gibson, and that was about the size of their staff uh, in that year. But soon expansion came around, and that took place in 1925 when Caxton made the transition to full-time book publishing and printing. And that's the year that Caxton issued The Idaho Citizen by Fred Lucas. The book had initially been privately printed for Lucas, but then Gibson decided to issue a second printing where Caxton assumed all the risk and agreed to pay royalties to Lucas. It ended up being a, very much a commercial success and it went into seven editions and multiple reprints over the next several years. And it even got adopted as a uh, textbook by the State's Department of Education, which certainly helped to boost sales. The Idaho Citizen, the publishing of the Idaho Citizen marked, as Gibson put it, their drift into publishing. And using the word drift really is no exaggeration. It was entirely a learning experience for all involved. They had to learn how to literally print the books. They had to learn how to market. They learned how, had to learn how to sell the books and distribute them across the country. None of their early staff had any training. They were mostly, as Gibson referred to them, local boys. 
and they all learned on the job. So they didn't come in with training on lithography or any of the other equipment. They all learned as they went along. So if any book that they produced had errors or was of inferior quality, it wasn't intentional, but simply out of ignorance. In 1926 and 1927, Caxton published two books per year. In 28, they increased that to four. Then in 1929, six books. In the 1930s, Caxton greatly increased their output, regularly issuing 10 to 15 books annually, and that's a pace they maintained for the next several decades, though some years in the 1940s they published as many as 25 to 30 books a year. And that frenetic pace is why, now 100 years later, they published almost 1,000 books. And keep in mind, they did all this publishing while also doing all their contact tract printing, uh, as well as serving as the state textbook depository. So publishing books really was just one facet of this small print shop. In the early years, they really sustained losses on almost every single title that they published. In fact, they didn't turn a profit in until 1941, which was 16 years after Idaho Citizen. Caxton was able to maintain that model of losing money by using their other departments, which were very successful, to offset and subsidize their book publishing department. Few of their books sold more than 5,000 copies, uh, which is very small for national distribution, especially for bu book publishers at that time. So again, the reason they were, another reason they were willing to take a financial loss and that financial situation was Gibson's deep belief in the importance of books. He wrote, it seemed to us that America should have at least one house that might be classified as non-commercial. By that we mean a publisher not dependent upon revenues from the publishing ve uh, venture for support. And that's an aerial view of Caxton printers, and it looks very much similar to the way it does today, just across the railroad tracks on Main Street in Caldwell. Most of Caxton's books from the 1920s garnered little interest or attention in the press. It's important to keep in mind that its publishers need, that, uh, need their books to be reviewed in the press, and it's not just, book reviews are not just for the benefit of the author. If a book sells uh, a higher number, it's obviously beneficial for royalties for the author, but it also benefits the publisher. So Caxton was keen to note when their books did receive attention. And that first mention in the press uh, took place in 1930. And so the first review of uh, a book occurred then. The Salt Lake Telegram reviewed Byron Deffenbach's Red Heroines of the Northwest. Deffenbach was a Boise resident and served as state treasurer from 1927 to 1930 and also wrote some history as well. The reviewer in the telegram noted, um, the reviewer not only wrote favorably of the book, but also praised Caxton printers, saying, you may not know it, but there's a publishing firm in Idaho that is doing more for Western literature than any of the larger houses of the East. It is the Caxton printers of Caldwell, Idaho, which for the past several years has brought out a number of books of which the West can well be proud. That reviewer touched on another key aspect of the uniqueness and importance of Caxton, and that's their location in the far west. Most publishing companies at that time, and still today, are located on the east coast, primarily in New York, Boston, and in Philadelphia. The novelist Wallace Stegner wrote a laudatory article in 1939 about Caxton. In it, Stegner wrote about the colonial complex that existed in book publishing. He was referring to the suspicion by both publishers and the public of everything not emanating from the urban centers of civilization. And by urban centers, he of course meant New York and Boston. And it really was a problem for writers of the time who were living in the West and writing about the West. It was very difficult for them to get noticed and taken seriously by those Eastern publishers. And so because of that, J.H. Gibson ensured the company's overarching philosophy was indeed to get writers published, especially first-time writers, with the hope that they might get their name out there and then get noticed by those establishment publishing houses. I want to note, so that's J.H. Gibson on the right, and then the woman in the middle there is Mabel Clore, and she served as secretary of the company uh, as one of their officers, and she was uh, Gibson's right-hand woman for the entire time that Gibson was there. She outlasted him at the company, and so she was very important to their history. 
So Caxton knew about that East and West tension firsthand when they published Vardis Fisher's novel In Tragic Life in 1932. Though largely forgotten today, Fisher was a well-known novelist with national recognition in the 30s and 40s. He was born in eastern Idaho and lived most of his later life in Hagerman. By 1932, Fisher already had two novels published by East Coast firms and was fairly well established and known as a novelist. His latest manuscript, however, was rejected by multiple publishers in the East because they said he dealt too frankly with the subject of sex. So these East Coast firms were refusing to publish in Tragic Life. And that's when Fisher approached Gibson about publishing that book. After seeking advice from external readers, Gibson agreed to publish the manuscript without making any changes. Let me make my position clear, he wrote to Fisher. I don't feel that there is anything in your manuscript which needs changing. I think it is marvelously done. The only question is whether you and we could stay in Idaho after the books were printed. <laughs> so what we have is a small town, Caldwell, Idaho, book publisher, willing to take a risk on this potentially risque novel that had been completely rejected by East Coast firms. Gibson didn't mind the, taking the risk at all and was willing to be shunned by Caldwell residents. So they went ahead and published the books, which ended up re, uh, receiving positive reviews. And so publishing In Tragic Life began a two-decade-long relationship, both personal and professional, between Gibson and Fisher. And Caxton published more than, a uh, more than a dozen of Fisher's novels. On the left is Fisher and Gibson at Fisher's home and cabin in, in Hagerman. So as I mentioned about the book reviews, Caxton would collect uh, reviews of their books. And in Fisher's case, they would even publish them in a pamphlet. And in this case, they listed the unfavorable negative reviews first. As Gibson wrote, we employ no ballyhoo. We do not delete the unfavorable words and phrases. Um, it's, it's still surprising to me that they would actually uh, set the unfavorable reviews first uh, and, be, and be so brutally honest about that. Uh, probably the most notable aspect of Gibson and Fisher's relationships were the books that Fisher wrote for the Federal Writers Project. And the Federal Writers Project was part of the Works Progress Administration during FDR's New Deal in the late 1930s. And the goal was to put unemployed writers back to work. Fisher was appointed the, the, the director of the Writers Project in Idaho. The, main, the initial main goal of the Writers Project was to produce a guidebook for every single state written by someone in that state. And so that was up to Fisher's, uh, ta that task was up to Fisher. True to his reputation as an acerbic individualist, Fisher pretty much wrote that entire guidebook by himself. And so he was able to get it done very, very quickly. And this very much surprised the Washington, D.C. office employees, because their preference was that the Washington, D.C. guidebook would come out first. So D.C. would come out first, it would set the stage, and then the other states could follow. But Fisher had an edge over Washington, D.C. In, in his relationship with Gibson and, and Caxton's. Gibson had agreed to absolutely publish uh, the guidebook to Idaho. And because of their close relationship, they were able to get it set and ready to go to publication very quickly. But the, uh, the bureaucrats in D.C. did not want that to happen. And I'll let Fisher uh, tell that story. The central office called me several times and said, we'll send a man out to stop you. And they did send the assistant director, who was in those years a rather distinguished novelist. He came out to stop us from publishing the book. We got him drunk. We took him to Gibson's home and got him drunk. And I put him on the train and sent him back to Washington. <laughs> and we went ahead and published the guide. And so Idaho, a guide in word and picture, very much was the first book, guidebook published for the Federal Writers Project. It came out to really positive reviews, and Idaho ended up setting the standard for the rest of the state's guidebooks, not Washington, D.C. <laughs> Through my research uh, in, in the archives over the past year and a half, I've been, I managed actually to track down some additional manuscripts that Fisher wrote for the Federal Writers Project that never were, were published. One of those manuscripts was a guide to Boise, written in the same style and in the same format as his guidebook for the whole state. 
I found it in the Library of Congress last year, and I'm pleased to say that Rediscovered Books is publishing it and releasing it this coming January. I tracked down historical photographs and included those, um, and, and we let Fisher's words stand as, as he wrote them in 1938. So it's very exciting that um, the release date will be January 30th through Rediscovered Books. You can pick up a, an unpublished uh, Fisher manuscript. Some other, and, and I'll, I can, I will be talking more about these discoveries uh, then, but some of the other manuscripts that Fisher wrote but never published include uh, one about Idaho playgrounds and recreation, as well as Idaho place names. Gibson's and, Gibson and Fisher's relationship unfortunately deteriorated in 1953 when Gibson asked Fisher to tone back his portrayal of Jesus in uh, one of Fisher's books before Caxton would agree to publish it. Although Gibson wasn't relig religious, I have never joined or attended any church, he wrote. He did have what he said was a profound respect for those who are sincerely religious. Fisher unsurprisingly refused Gibson's request to make changes to the, to the novel, writing, you seem determined to force me to do what you feel must be done to avoid any possible offense to the Roman church. I cannot and will not go that far. Fisher continued, it is amazing to me when a man who says he stands for freedom of the human mind should expect me to defer to religious dogmas when my books, as you well know, rest upon the findings of the greatest scholars. And so that, that pretty much ended their relationship. Fisher never was published again through Caxton during Gibson's lifetime. And Fisher instead had the rest of his novels published through Alan Swallow Press, located in Denver. So prospects were looking particularly strong for Caxton, unfortunately, when tragedy struck on St. Patrick's Day, 1937, when a fire swept through the entire plant, destroying almost all the structures and the equipment inside. The fire caused more than a half a million dollars worth of damage. However, they did not let this tragedy set them back and Gibson vowed to rebuild immediately, and he did so. They got the plant back up and running within a few months, and despite being in the midst, also being in the midst of the Great Depression, Gibson vowed and was able to pay all of his employees during the entire time they were closed for rebuilding. He very much cared about his employees, and in turn his employees were very loyal and dedicated to him. Selfishly, from an uh, archival researcher point of view, it's the sadness of the fire means that the company's records pre-1937 were pretty much completely destroyed. Some did survive and were donated to Washington State University along with the rest of Caxton's records. Um, however, as a researcher, it's very difficult to go through those because of the burnt edges and they start to chip off and, and it's, it's difficult to read. However, it, it's fantastic that at least some of the records were salvaged. In the 1940s and 50s, Caxton maintained uh, and continued on publishing books and did so with, with growing national attention. Reviewers also noted the high quality of Caxton's books. According to one article, Caxton expends on each book the same loving care and painstaking craftsmanship characterizing the handicraft of that earlier Caxton. Every pr title printed on site was bound by hand and they often printed uh, deluxe editions of their books in buckram leather and often signed by the author. So this is an example uh, for one of Fisher's novels of that deluxe edition. Articles appeared in large newspapers including the New York Times and the LA Times spotlighting Caxton. Gibson maintained a growing list of correspondents, including with Ezra Pound and H.L. Mencken, among dozens and dozens of others. Jack Conroy, who was a leftist labor writer whose most famous novel is The Disinherited, um, praised Caxton for their approach to publishing. Writers too frank, he wrote, or too limited in popular appeal to tempt commercial publishers have been given a voice. He continued, Caxton doesn't dump their slow sellers on the, remainders on the remainder tables where they sell with no royalty to the author a few months after publication, which was and is still a common practice for these larger publishing houses. When the books don't sell, they put a black mark on them and they ship them off to the remainder tables. 
So that philosophy meant that Caxton contributed uh, more than a few titles to the ever-growing list of bad books of poetry. But for every dud, there were multifold more books that made a lasting contribution. And I want to highlight a few titles related to Idaho that did particularly well. So Lucullus Virgil McOrder wrote two books on the Nez Perce tribe, Yellow Wolf and Hear Me, My Chiefs, in 1940 and then 1952. And both of those books told the story of the Nez Perce War from the point of view of the Native Americans. And this was the first time that had been done. So those two books are still foundational texts to the study of the Nez Perce War today. On a lighter side, uh, two children's books, uh, both by uh, Del J. McCormick, uh, are still in print and still available today. Uh, Paul Bunyan Swings His Axe was first published uh, in 1941, and Del J. McCormick was a Boise resident. And in conversation with, with current employees at Caxton, it very much still is a, a good seller for them. I want to pause and, and talk a bit more about J.H. Gibson and note that he was not just a book publisher. He was very much involved in politics. Um, in 1912, he served as state chairman of the Bull Moose Party, which worked to get uh, Theodore Roosevelt elected. And then also in the 19-teens, he was a member of the Progressive Party of Idaho. Uh, as the decades went on, he became more involved with the Republican Party. He was close friends with Idaho Senator William Bora, and he corresponded with most Idaho politicians. He really maintained a, a huge list of correspondence. And in the bottom center there is a photo of Gibson meeting with uh, Senator Henry Dorshak from Idaho in his DC office. And so given J.H.'s political leanings, he also published a series of libertarian books that had several dozen titles. And then, most notably, he published Ayn Rand's novel, novella Anthem in 1952, which was the first American hardcover edition. And that book is also still in print today. So turning back to Caxton's history, um, Caxton was not alone in regional, in regional publishing. Two other publishers, Alan Swallow, as I mentioned earlier, who published Vardis Fisher, and Binford and Mort in Portland, Oregon, were two other important publishers in the West. But neither of those two companies were as old as Caxton or earned the national reputation that Caxton did. Other unique qualities of Caxton's books are that they would publish their books jointly with other American publishers. So it's common for a book to be published simultaneously by different publishers in different countries. But it's less common for the same book to be published domestically at the same time by two different publishers. Caxton was willing to do this, however, because they did acknowledge that the East Coast firms had a better distribution setup going, and they were also able to create bigger sales for the titles. And beyond joint publishing, Caxton was also willing to release their authors to other publishers. Most authors, especially the, the well-known ones, tend to, stay with, tend to stay with the same publishing firm for their entire career. Yet, with um, Lawrence Henry Gibson's books, The British Empire Before the American Revolution, the first three were published by Caxton. So the, the familial relationship uh, brought those to market. But then after the third one came out, Alfred Knopf, a well-known New York publisher, took notice of those books and asked Caxton if they could take over publishing Lawrence Henry's books. Gibson, being the generous person that he was, agreed to that and released his brother to Knopf. And so Knopf brought out the rest of those volumes. And it was one of those later volumes that eventually earned Lawrence Henry Gibson the Pulitzer Prize. James H. Gibson passed away in 1965 at the, at the age of 79, and, and I didn't include it here, but he's buried in Caldwell at Canyon Hill Cemetery, and his, uh, his headstone, he's buried with his wife, reads Gibson, and under that it's Gibson Americans, and, and gives their name and includes Caxton's uh, colophon. Um, in spite of, of Gibson's passing, Caxton continued strong. Gibson's two sons, J. H. Jr. and Gordon, who had long worked for Caxton, uh, took over the business as president and managing director. The 1960s and 1970s were a time of continued success for the publishing division, and they continued bringing out books related to Idaho and to the West. 
Caxton Books won several awards for both excellence in publishing and for excellence in writing. In 1969, the gold rushes in mining camps of the early American West, which is that big book at the far end of the table, uh, won the Golden Spur Award of the Western Writers of America for their best nonfiction book. That book was published by Vardis Fisher and his wife, Laurel Opal Holmes, and it was actually the last book that was published, uh, that, that Fisher wrote before he passed away in 1968. In 1998, Caxton changed the name of their publishing arm to Caxton Press, and then they renamed the retained the name Caxton Printers for the rest of their divisions, their contract printing jobs, et cetera. Some of those contracts include printing election ballots for 33 of Idaho's counties. So if you voted on Tuesday, you handled a Caxton product. They are still Idaho's official state textbook depository. And they also serve as the distributor for small presses, including the now defunct University of Idaho Press. A year ago this month, the US Senate Committee on Small Business named Caxton the Small Business of the Month for the entire United States and they continued to publish books related to Idaho, ranging from history to travel guides to, to science books. Some of the most recent titles include Backcountry Roads Idaho, The Idaho Traveler, which is just coming out right now, um, Fishes of Idaho, and a biography of Morley Nelson, to name just a few. Caxton Today, which is on the right, um, is still owned and managed by the Gibson family. It's been in the family the entire time. Scott Gibson, J.H.'s great-grandson, is the president and publisher for the company. His brother, Ron, is the chief operating officer, and his father, Dave Gibson, is the past president and current chairman of the board. And they still hold on to J.H. Gibson's original philosophy to publish good books about the, about the region, regardless of how many they sell. In fact, as Scott Gibson told me, he views printing books as part of a sacred trust the company holds. The company's bylaws dictate that the company continue to publish books, even though they continue not to make the company that much money. Despite all that has changed over the last 100 years and the major changes in the way that information is shared and disseminated, Caxton Printers continues to operate in pretty much the same way it operated in its early decades when it was under the care of James H. Gibson. They're still in Caldwell, Idaho, at 312 Main Street, downtown. They're still publishing authors, other houses won't, and they're still not concerned about making a profit with their books. And their focus is still on quality and wanting to produce a long-lasting product. And all of this, their philosophy, their location, their quality, all of Caxton's history, forms an integral part in preserving Idaho's own history while also remaining true to their founding philosophy that books are more than mere merchandise. Thank you very much.